What's up guys, Ian Sandusky from Lakewood Machine and Tool back here again for Practical Machinist. And today we've got something very special for you. You know, we see some really huge shops, we don't often get to see where these shops start. And today I'm joined by my friend Curtis from Millspec Manufacturing. Nice to meet you. To see exactly where a shop can start. Now Curtis, tell us a little bit about how you got into manufacturing. I got into manufacturing with my grandfather was a machinist for Jordan doing the rollbacks and making the handles for him. And my godfather was also a machinist as well. And, you know, being around that majority of my life, and then I went into the military, got out, and then I went to NASCAR Tech for their CNC program and went through that. And I, I just found a passion for it going through that course because it was just an idea of my grandfather did it, my godfather done it, and all these parts they made were so cool. And then when I went into the course, I just found, I got a slight obsession of it. It was so much passion. And then once I got out into the field and I wanted to do more and more, and next thing you know, I go to all these shops and they're just, you know, we've been doing it this way for 20 years. Right. Right. And technology is ever changing. Okay. So with coatings and tooling and everything changing, it's like, I want to, I want to put it out there. All right. But also with going to those shops, a lot of companies say veterans are like they priding on them, but sometimes they really don't. Like when you get out, all right, and go to shops themselves, you have CMP exams and all that. And sometimes you'd be like six months out. Oh. Sometimes you'll have like three in a week. And a lot of employers don't like that. They'll be like, you're missing too much work, you know? And I wanted to create a business that would be perfectly fine and focused on veterans themselves. And that's where we are now. Yes. Let's go take a peek. So this isn't actually where you got started. From what I understand, you actually started programming before you actually opened your shop. Yes. And how did that kind of evolve into where we are now? Um, I, I was blessed enough that my first job, they were perfectly fine with teaching me how to program while going to NASCAR Tech. So part-time job, they were amazing, all right? And with learning all the skills on the job while going to school made me much better programmer. And then over the time and years of collecting more knowledge and everything, getting out, I became a, a remote CAD CAM programmer to start my own business. So you were actually helping shops out where they are from your location doing things like programming mills, programming lathes, and actually doing design for parts for them as well. Yes, I was also doing product design for a couple customers. So I take their idea and I can put it on a print, and make it manufacturable for them for either if they want me to do it or if they want to outsource it to other people. So either way, you can either do it now in house or sometimes I guess for things that are just beyond your capabilities on this floor at the moment, yes. you can actually connect them with someone who can do it. Yes. Now let's take a look at this shop here if you don't mind. I think this is really interesting. This is actually a unit that you know the guy who owns this place. Yes, the, the owner of this building, he is a military veteran as well. And I went to school with him in the NASCAR tech. So when it came time to actually open a shop, you had a good spot to already come to. Yes, I had, like, I had a very good uh, support system and all that too. Um, you know, like the, the shop itself is very decent decently sized and we did a layout you know watching other shops and watching other videos that you know you guys are practical machinists and a bunch of other people have done just doing that research and education made my shop the way it is today and surprisingly for small shops you know we hear a lot of times guys are looking for a small space to open and one thing that i always tend to say is like make sure you get a spot that you can expand in yes. it looks like you have a spot that you can actually grow here for a substantial amount of time before you get to the point where you might need to look at a bigger location. Yes. And this machine here, this is a Haas VF4. What year is this thing? This is a 1998 Haas VF4 with the automatic pallet changer. Now I haven't seen a machine of this age with a pallet changer. Was that put on there stock originally? Yes, that is actually from the factories. So it came this way? Yes. Now that's got two pallets. That's essentially the whole table can swap out like that. Yeah. The Literally, it'll indicate back, slide that table out, indicate forward, slide that table in. I can do setups while it's running a machine in there, or you know, I can swap out parts, 
you know, let it know that that pallet's ready to send off to the next. And one thing I found really interesting when we just took a quick look at this is when you got this, you got a smoking deal on it, but there were a couple issues with it. Yes. The issues that were with this, it would run perfectly fine and do everything you needed, but you had to hand code everything. So you need to know all the G code, all the M codes and everything, even pertaining to the pallet changer itself. Right. So doing all that, it's very time consuming. Absolutely. But we had to replace the processor, the Mocom board and the video board on this machine. After that, we were able to actually use CAM software to expedite the process. So for the beginning, you were literally, <laughs> everything was finger cam. Everything. How did you, just out of curiosity, when you would verify that, would you just verify it in the screen? You would verify it through simulation, you know, and make sure everything looked good on the screen itself. And then also doing a prove out, you know, op stop, you know, and also doing single block, you know, runs. 25% rapid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But this machine, it looks to be in absolutely fantastic condition. As any of you guys know who have seen my shop, I have a 94 and a 96, very similar vintage. I think there's a lot of hesitation for a lot of people because when they go to open a shop or they're thinking about it, they think you have to go buy a huge DMG or a Mazak or you know these really incredible machines and they are incredible. But you can get started and get making good parts intolerance with something that's, you know, almost 30 years old. Yes. And in fact, I am all about older machines. You know, I've been asked, so when you go and trade that in and get a new one, it's like, I ain't doing that. This no. is going to stay with my company forever. That's the way I look <laughs> at it too, because people have said, you know, hey, listen, uh, something broke on it and I need to fix it. That's an expensive fix. Why don't you get a new machine? In my opinion, it's always, right now I have capacity. I can't buy capacity for the amount it's going to cost to fix it. Yep. In the long run, eventually you might think about switching it, but... Right now it's capacity, it stays capacity. I, I think it's a great machine to have in the house. And not only that, cost effectiveness too. Like looking at an older machine that has say more capability because it has a pallet changer. Absolutely. On it. All right, and it's a VF4, you know, 50 inch tables on it compared to same price of what you would give for a tool room mill. You know? <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> You're I, talking one of the little tiny bench tops yeah, I heard and, you paid for this. Yeah, and this has got way more horsepower than that. <laughs> Now, as a guy who started a shop and, you know, you did have a kind of a pipeline of work coming in when you started because of the design, what kind of ways have you been looking to fill this machine with work? Uh, I've been looking at, well, not looking at, I actually use like ThomasNet yep. and Zometry to actually like do filler work. And, but ThomasNet's more or less my marketing of how I get out there, of course, and also physical networking. Of course. Physical networking is... I say at least 85% of the job. Just from going out and meeting people, how do you do that? And you know, we're in a, a small town, pretty close to a fairly large city. What ways have you found with that kind of networking? What events, what methods have you been using to do that? Uh, events, I follow a, uh, a group called Warrior Rising and they're all veterans about entrepreneurship. Oh, awesome. All right, so they literally educate other veterans on how to become entrepreneurs. And it's, it's amazing for the information that they toss out and how to tell you how to be a business owner and business person itself. And I mean, from there, all the networking and uh, events that they have going even to IMTS, that's a huge networking event. You found that a good networking event, even from, you know, people think, again, you have to be a big shop with massive capabilities to benefit from that. You found that beneficial. Yes. I mean, honestly, like just meeting people in, in themselves and getting your name out there. Oh, it's it, just meeting people and getting their knowledge. Cause you know, there's always people out there that have more knowledge than you. I have not found somebody out there that does not have more knowledge than me yet. So I would agree with that 100%. <laughs> Let's keep taking a peek at this machine shop. So right now, this is kind of the setup you're running. This is a pretty standard layout, I would say for a shop. What kind of stuff are you keeping in this tool drawer? This uh, tool, uh, tool chest right here, the one over there is for all my work holding. This one is for, you know, just in process inspection checks and setup. But then I also have my hand tools and I have my organized end mills, drills, keyway cutters. Call it. So yeah, you got a good selection there. I have a very similar box at my shop. <laughs> now walking around here, like I said, you guys do have a fairly large space for what's going on here. This obviously is how you had to get wired in for your service for your shop. Correct. Was this already here or did you have to handle that? I had to handle that. I had to actually buy that phase converter and have it installed from the panel to the machine itself. And was that a 
large undertaking because if you don't know, you can't just plug these things into the wall. No, I mean, it's not like a Tormach. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you can plug it in and use your house power. But this one, because of you know the electricity that it uses, it, it costs a huge amount of money. Like, I mean, when I say huge, you know, that's coming from a small business perspective. Absolutely. You know, of like nine grand. That's a lot of money to me too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, like that's get the electrician out here with the permit to actually hook it up, hook the system up, make sure it's correct so he doesn't blow a $6,000 unit. Which is uh, something you don't want to do your first day. Yeah. Now this, to talk on the budget, I believe you said originally that this entire operation you got up and going for less than $40,000. Yes. Everything that has come to this business, like, you know, that we purchased is about $40,000. That's a very, very small amount compared to what a lot of people think. You don't need to go and get investors. You don't need to get angel investing. You don't need to get stockbrokers involved. No. You can, if you save and you plan properly, get these things started. Essentially, you can get them going at a very affordable price. Yeah, they're cost effective. Cost I mean, effective, that's a good way to put yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you could, like I said, with these old machines that are reliable and you can fix them yourselves, which I, I love. So with older machines, you know, making this all cost effective, that right there by itself, like for how much you would get a new machine, it, it was a lot cheaper. Absolutely, I, by far. Now, one thing I do see here, and it's something that people don't think about when they get involved in machining, is chip and scrap management. With a small shop, how are you handling, obviously I see you have a decent sized bin here, how are you handling actually getting rid of that scrap? Uh, we actually have a local, uh, it's like aluminum and steel uh, recycling center. And I literally just have to take that and I hook a trailer onto my truck, just roll it on, dump it off, come back. And they'll even pay you for it sometimes. Yep. Depending on. <laughs> as long as it's clean. <laughs> now this over here is, I assume, kind of the more finishing manual end of things. What are we looking at here? Uh, just a regular, you know, Harbor Freight drill press and a cross slide, bench grinder, a hand sander. It's to do deburr, finishing work, you know, knock off all those burrs, take out some people don't like machine surfaces. Right. So doing all that right here and keeping it all neat, clean, organized. And this isn't just looking like this because we're coming in. This is pretty much, I would imagine, how you keep it yes. all the time. Now these racks here, this is interesting. These to me look like dining trays. Yes. They, they are dining trays. In fact, those are speed racks from bakery, all right? In which you can go buy them for like really cheap and to have them on wheels, to move parts around. I mean, it's, it's very like a cost effective. Absolutely. In a small, small shop, you got to think outside the box and make things work. And with this, you know, the big trays for a lot bigger pieces that I've mm -hmm. done, small trays for multiple small pieces. This is a really interesting use of space that I haven't seen before. Really? And especially for a small shop where space is at a premium, trying to keep costs down to get things going. This is actually something that I would highly recommend. I might get a couple of them for my shop, to be honest. It's interesting. We have carts that we roll around, but nothing like these. Yeah, and not only that, it's really cheap to get the, the trays themselves. For online, there's a place called Webstaurant, and you can buy like a pack of 20 sometimes for like 100 bucks. That's not bad at all. No. Moving over here, what do we have on this side? This is our inspection area. It's, it's very general, very generic, but as jobs come along, when you do jobs as a startup company, of course, you're gonna pay yourself, you're gonna put back for cost, but you're also gonna put some money to the side for you know, investing back into the company. Absolutely. And as you invest into the company, you build upon your inspection area and buy more pins, gauges, blocks, We've got a height gauge, we've got an indicator. I take it these are gonna be our gauge blocks in here. Yes, They sir. certainly are. This is a nice little inspection area. And again, one of the big themes about this I really wanna get across everybody is that, again, you think you need a CMM. You think you need a dedicated climate controlled area. For most general work, this is actually a very, very effective setup. The setup we have in my shop, it's got a bigger granite plate and maybe a few different tools that aren't here, but fundamentally it's the same. Yes. Not much changes. No. And then going over here, what are we looking at? I'm taking, I'm going to venture a guess here. This is shipping. Yep. Shipping and receiving. And receiving. Yes. How this shop is laid out, this door right here actually 
accepts the material coming in and then they, we fill out the material receiving inspection report to make sure the material is, itself is good and not broken, you know, gouged and whatnot, had that happen. It's one thing that I think also that's worth pointing out. This is a two person operation right now and you guys are already set up in a way that if you grow, this is all standardized. Yes. So you could pass this to someone else now and say, this is how you do it. You're not trying to figure it out as you go along. Yes, what you'll notice uh, when you start a shop, all right, starting small and getting that already hardwired in mm -hmm. is much easier than once, you know, I'll wait until we got like 10 people. All right. And then from that point, it's so much harder to get all those people educated. Backtrack all. Yeah. <laughs> and then also you have to do all the paperwork from hard like papers to digital files, time consuming. You might as well do it right off the bat with the tools that are given to you. And let's look at this over here. This is where you have some receiving coming in. I see that there are job travelers here. And I do see what looks like a prototype of a part. What are we looking at here? Yes, this part right here, uh, we are actually tasked with a local law enforcement group, uh, a sheriff's department. They have duty belts, you know, and on their duty belts, they have a actual state issued phone. And with that state issued phone, they have nowhere to put it, you know, which is, you know, kind of funny. It sounds silly, but. <laughs> yeah, but like helping these guys out because, you know, they're law enforcement, they, you know, protect and serve and they help everybody around them like helping these guys out, designing an actual phone clip for them to put on their duty belts. It's going, it's going to help out a lot, you know, keep them, you know, hands-free, able to do what they need to do with their phone. And with this here, is this a prototype that you actually designed and got worked up yourself? The actual sheriff that, you know, brought this up to me, he's the one that designed it and printed this out for me. And from that print, you know, we did prototyping and then, you know, we're now into the manufacturing phase of that. Absolutely. And then over here, this is another thing I just want to point out. Everybody, again, I, I know this kind of comes down to it doesn't take as much as you think, but you know, we talk a lot about air. You can't yes. have a shop work without good air. What are you running over here for air? This is, I, I, I get some controversy on it. It's, an, it's like a 95 uh, Craftsman air compressor, yep. 33 gallon, but it's a six horsepower, you know, air compressor, which is you know, to keep this running machine, it does perfectly fine. And there's, you don't need like a big, you know, screw machine, no. screw compressor or anything. This will work perfectly fine. And I, that also powers your airlines out the front too. Yes. So you are completely set up just with that. Yep. Now I think a lot of the bootstrapping I'm seeing here, it just impresses me so much because instead of finding reasons why you couldn't do it, you found ways to make it work. Yes. Period. Yep. Now, just to touch on it, what are you kind of looking at for expansion or Maybe even next steps for things that you want to put in here or things you're looking at next. Uh, I'm looking at getting a lathe next. I, I've got, you know, repeat customers that are like, hey, when are you going to get a lathe? When are you going to get a lathe? All right, because having a lathe and a mill, you put both worlds together, you, it's amazing. You can do start to finish on just about anything. Exactly. And are you looking to eventually, I mean, eventually I'm sure, but how soon would you think you're looking to either bring someone in, maybe part time? Is that something you're considering or are you trying to keep it as lean as possible? I mean, once I get everything down, uh, we're in the process of becoming an AS9100, you know, an ITAR registrant. I'm trying to get that in and get all that paperwork done. So once that's in and we're able to educate the next person in, that's a, we're going to immediately bring somebody in. After one that. at a time, one at a time. And yep. before you know it, you'll have more people than you know what to do with. Yeah. So Rebecca, you are the other half of this operation, but you actually came from a different background than manufacturing. Yes, yeah, surprising or not, I've actually came from the culinary industry. I did two years at a technical school and then I went to college for it up in Pennsylvania. And how do you feel that's helped translate into what you guys do here? Well, we're not cooking here, but the idea of mise en place, which means everything in its place and cleanliness and stations has transformed our shop into making sure there's an inspection station with everything laid out what we need. The shipping station, everything's laid out right there what you need. Um, so it really was a great asset to have my education in culinary arts because it matched perfectly for manufacturing. I mean, because what you're describing right there, you know, if it, that sounds familiar to anybody, that's called, they call it lean mm -hmm. in manufacturing. Yes. And so you were kind of doing it maybe without even really knowing mm -hmm. that you were doing it, but it's a fantastic strategy. Yes, I agree. So obviously starting a business and maybe something that you weren't as familiar with, 
as much as we would hope that it all goes well, sometimes things pop up. Mm -hmm. What kind of challenges did you guys face starting this and how did you kind of get past them? Oh my goodness, the biggest hurdle for me was just learning the lingo in the industry. I did not go to school for this, so everything is completely self-taught. And um, from learning what is an RFQ coming through and making sure that my marketing emails are making sure when I'm designing my website, is this making sense? Is the correct terminology? Or even just listening to the machine where I'm like, Curtis, are you sure that thing's not gonna explode? It was, it was a lot to take in, but actually watching videos like yours helped me absorb a lot of information and it was very beneficial. So I thank you for continuing doing the practical oh, machine. Thank you very much. Now, as someone who came into the trade completely from the outside and has had to kind of hit the ground running and learn, what would you say to people who are maybe outside the trade that want to get involved in it? Uh, learn as much as you can. And the best people to learn from is people ahead of you in your path. So if you can go to other machine shops and find someone that's in the position that you want to be in, talk to them. You'd be surprised how friendly people are and willing to share their journey with you. And then other than that, I call it YouTube University. You can learn anything you want to on YouTube. So what I'll do is when I'm cooking dinner, I'll have my phone up and I'll be watching somebody machine stuff or deburring. Oh my goodness, I, I do deburring here too. And I was like, how do I use this little deburr tool? And I was watching like 20 videos to make sure I was doing it correctly. But if you want to learn it enough, you have the resources available for free to go out and find this stuff so you can get on the right track. There's literally never been a better time to try to get involved in this stuff yeah. because you don't have to go to school. You yeah, can do exactly. it all on your own time, on your own schedule. You know, I know you guys have a busy life, yeah. kids, jobs, responsibilities, mm -hmm. and you still found time to do it. And clearly it's working out for you. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's been very rewarding. So there you have it, guys. Thank you very much for having us by today. It's so inspiring to see a shop getting off the ground mm -hmm. and clearly doing all the right things. And I hope we get to see more of you here on Practical Machinist. If people want to find out more about Millspec Manufacturing, where should they go? You can go to our website or we're even on uh, Instagram as well. We share a lot of content daily here. Excellent. Thank you very much, guys. Absolute pleasure. Thank you.